So hello everyone, this is Dr. Garrett Smith, the nutrition detective around these here YouTube parts. And we have another number 133 today um, we're going to be doing, and let me pop out the chat. So we're doing all subscriber chat. So if you wanted to post a question, you need to be a subscriber to the channel. Um, <laughs> as Mathe in the chat said, we, we got to six thousand six hundred and sixty something subscribers so of course this is illuminati confirmed this confirms you know i work for them and you know i'm evil to my core that's why i'm fighting against them that's why i get people off of medications and why i get people off of wasting money on supplements and why i get people better so they stop paying the pharma cartel and the doctors and all that stuff so they can be better for good yes this is me this is this is my evil work it's my evil plan. So it's working. You better watch out. So having my niacin flush drink. And for those of you who are interested, nicotinic acid. Yes. When we talk about niacin here, I don't mention niacin much. When we talk about niacin here, we are talking about only nicotinic acid, aka flush niacin. We are not talking about any of the other garbage out in the market that is overpriced and potentially damaging like niacinamide, nicotinamide, any of that stuff. So we talk about nicotinic acid, flush niacin. If you want to learn more about it, that's in the Love Your Liver program. Hopefully, uh, <clears throat> Kelsey Kenny will be making an appearance here in the chat. I've been talking to her lately about helping more with um, possibly even doing her own niacin consults with people, which will be fun. So yeah, I know, Mathe. I'm definitely, uh, definitely. Oh wait, I gotta open up. Oh, I didn't open up Telegram for for Joe. I guess I'll just have to keep my phone going. Um, so anyway, so if you have a super chat, if if you know what super chats are, super chats are where you can make a little contribution to the channel. And what that does is that will pop your question up to the top of the list. And so if you want to get your question answered, oh, there's Kelsey. There's Kelsey in the chat. So let me. Okay, yeah. So, what, Joe, I got you. Um, and so, yeah, if you have, if you want your chat to go to the top of the list, there's super chats. If you want to do that, otherwise, I just go in order how they're posted. So here we go. So Mathay, <laughs> Mathay says the binge watching continues from his side. He's on number ninety nine. This is the current stream he's watching. Yes, there is a. I do like to give a warning. There is a huge risk of binge watching if you come to this channel and your logic and your your skepticism of mainstream is is properly working yeah you'll find lots of information here that um can can really get you um attached so and good morning to all of you so will made it today good um let's see we had yes will says i'm a confirmed bought and paid for deep state shill because i say to do all the opposite things yes this you can obviously tell that I'm 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 pushed by the mainstream by my subscriber numbers, right? Six thousand something subscribers. Ooh, I'm really coming up. They're really backing me up. Like when you look at uh, what's the guy? The guy I did the white lung syndrome on calls himself a doctor, and he teaches at a nursing school. Um, I forget his name, but uh, yeah, he's got two million subscribers, and all he keeps saying is vitamin A deficiency is causing all sorts of problems. So yeah, uh, Stugtron says he's vaping nicotine while he builds software. Got to switch over. You're gonna want yeah, yeah. you're gonna want to switch off of that definitely. Um, Trusty Rusty says I'm his favorite doctor. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay, Sydney asks, what is the best folate supplement out there? If the folinic supplement, folinic acid or calcium folinate supplement isn't available anywhere anymore, what is the next best? Well. I can feel this, the, the flush starting. Can you see my face starting to turn a little pink? Um, so the flush is not scary, folks. Just start slow and work up. But we talk about all of that in the program. So cheers. Let's have some more. And yes, there is more in my cup than just flush niacin. And my buffer of choice, magnesium carbonate. We are the uh, Kelsey... And, and in the Love Your Liver program, Kelsey's Telegram group, and in the Love Your Liver program, we're the only people 
talking about buffering niacin, and this can help prevent any of the potential issues that niacin can cause. So folinic acid. Okay, folinic acid. This is this is hilarious. If you don't know about folinic acid, this is my preferred form of folate. If you're going to supplement, for some reason, the government just made this vitamin, all aspects of it, it's prescription only. And the only indication for it is while somebody's going through chemotherapy. My favorite folate, little, little while after I started using it with people, well, not a little while, I've been using it for years, but they make it prescription only now. Now, why would they have to make folinic acid prescription only? Do they have lots of evidence of it hurting people if they have access to it as a supplement? Because, I mean, even MTHF, right? Methyl tetrahydrofolate, the methylated form of folate, which I don't use, it's available over the counter and it's available in mega doses pharmaceutically. It's still available. And they're happy to give you folic acid. But they take the one that I like that's not methylated away from everyone, basically. We're working on, I need to talk to um, my people and possibly a compounding pharmacy about how to make folinic acid accessible to people so that they can get it for some sort of decent rate you know off label off label prescribing <laughs> if you have a folate deficiency then you can do it but anyway food wise beans which is a big part of the program beans are one of the highest foods in folate the biggest thing you can do to restore your folate is to not eat vitamin a i have a whole video on this channel about how vitamin a depletes folate and B12 and raises homocysteine. So the biggest thing you can do, it, as, as we say, you want to stop intoxing before you really try to start detoxing. So if you want to fix your folate and your potassium and all these other things, you want to stop taking in vitamin A as much as you can. And then if you decide to supplement, well, if you're going to go foods, there's lots of folate in foods. I mean, one food that some people refuse to do on, the, on this approach because they think it's too high in vitamin A is asparagus, but asparagus is really high in folate and B1. And I personally feel amazing on asparagus, so I don't leave it out. So you got those things, beans and asparagus. If you can get white asparagus, that's the best. And then if you decide to supplement, I don't really have a good option for you right now in terms of how to get calcium folinate. If you can find there may still be some 800, yeah, I'm itching a little bit. There may still be some 800 microgram folinic acid or calcium folinate pills out there. And if you wanted to get 400 micrograms a day, a person might take one every other day. So then you average out to 400 a day. I still have the Designs for Health super liquid folate drops. I mean, there's something like 1,200 drops in that bottle. So if you if you were lucky enough to buy that before um, before they ran out, then you still likely have those. So that's what we got. Um, let me see. We got a super chat from Gianni Gianni. Thank you very much. He says, "Hello, Doc. Can nicotinic acid cause anxiety and agitation? Is it due to increased bile production?" Thanks. Well, Gianni Gianni, I hope you've read read us uh, read. <laughs> I'm like going off your name, Gianni Ried. Um, I hope you've read the articles in the Love Your Liver program because we do specifically mention. So, so you have to understand, folks, if you, if you don't understand toxic bile theory yet, that's, that's the basis. That's how we're going to change the paradigm of medicine and actually fix people. Um, you want to watch on this channel. He, there, Joe's got it right away. Episodes in 53 and 71 to get the basics of toxic bile theory. So you understand how all this works. Now, what the, the simple explanation here is that your chronic health issues, yours, I'm mean, talking the, the, the uh, royal yours, are caused by toxic bile and what's in it. So the, the bile is toxic itself and all the other things that are in it, toxic metals, vitamin A, copper, manganese, all that stuff is leaking into your bloodstream. 
And then this causes your symptoms. And when you start to recognize, when you understand this concept and you start to recognize your bile dumping patterns and you start to learn the things that can trigger bile dumping and the things that over time will increase your bile production, which you want, but it also, if you go up too fast, you can get symptoms, the very same symptoms that you've had. So it's, it's like, you know, it's like you could exercise and get stronger, which you want to do stronger, faster, whatever, but you could also over-exercise and make yourself feel pretty bad or injure yourself. So we have just, just like exercise, you gotta, you gotta kind of take care. You're not trying to hurt yourself with it. You're trying to make yourself better. So can nicotinic acid cause anxiety and agitation? Abs it could cause almost anything to get aggravated. Absolutely. Almost anything we do on the program that is long-term good for people in the short term, if you overdo it, it can easily make you feel worse. It can easily cause some of these symptoms. If you And it does. Uh, I don't know if Kelsey has the study on the increased bile production. Um, Kelsey, if you have those, if you can pull up those studies and you want to put them in the chat, go ahead. Um, yes, it will over time increase bile production. It will speed up your ALDH, your aldehyde dehydrogenase, the most important detox enzyme in your entire body, in my opinion. And yeah, so basically it would be... Uh, of course, I, keep, I always talk about this. So, of course, my my um, my mother's going to see a doctor about doing uh, PRP injections into her shoulder today. And, of course, he calls during the live stream. Of course. It's just the way things are these days. So, basically, what we would say, so things you might do, if you were having this issue, first of all, it may be too big. A, you may have jumped in at too big a dose. One of the famous sayings we have in the Love Your Liver program is, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. So if you're going to push too much niacin because you get excited and you think Dr. Smith speaks so highly of this, I'm just going to jump right in and come what may. I know he said I might not feel good, but I'm just going to jump in. Well, if you're going to be dumb... You better be tough. There is a reason I warn people. I give I give thorough warnings all throughout the Love Your Liver program. Do I not, folks? I tell people, if you overdo it, here's what's going to happen. And then people overdo it. And then sometimes they come here or they come on the network and they're like, is it normal to feel this way? And I'll be like, well, yeah, we said it in the articles and I told you not to do that. <laughs> and then they, then they feel kind of silly because... They go back and they read and they're like, oh, he really did say not to do that or not to go too fast. And if you go too fast, back off. So that would be something. So things you might consider, Johnny Johnny, that we talk about in the Love Your Liver program in the nicotinic acid section, so graciously made available to us by Kelsey Kenny herself. One, you may need to buffer the niacin. And there is an entire article in there on how to buffer niacin. You just, it's very simple. You can do it with pills. You can do it with powders. That may help reduce some of the issues that you're having. Next, um, you could consider using some sort of charcoal with it to bind to the, um, to the bile dump as it comes out. So some people do it with the niacin itself, I'm considering that it may be more useful. This is just a theory of mine. I come up with lots of theories. But taking the charcoal with the niacin may miss the bile dump. You know, because like the niacin's going down through the charcoal's moving with it. And what if the charcoal has moved past where the bile dump happens? It's just a theory. So if you want, if any of you out there want to experiment with it, you could try charcoal with the niacin and potentially some charcoal after the niacin has been in your system for a while. Just a thought. Um, I'm not taking any charcoal with mine this morning because I've gotten to the point when I, when I do come out with, I do have some l recent labs. I'm waiting on another set of them, but I have almost no bile in my blood. 
the very thing we say we're trying to fix here. My labs say that I have almost below their detection limit limits of bile in my blood. So we say what we're working on here. I've been doing this for five years. I'm testing the bile in my blood. There's almost no bile in my blood. So the fun thing will be when I end up doing some, some uh, post physique photos for all the, all the haters on, on social media. So they'll get to see me um, and how I look at 48 without being on TRT, like all the other influencers, it'll be fun. So, yeah, so that's basically it. The, the, the buffering, the char charking, as Kelsey likes to call it, or using charcoal with it, uh, potentially more potassium. Anxiety and agitation can definitely be a potassium deficiency symptom. And what causes what causes potassium deficiency to get significantly worse quickly? Well, if you dumped more bile, what's in bile? Well, first of all, there's the toxic bile itself, but then there's copper. Copper depletes potassium. There would be vitamin A in that bile. Your body's trying to get rid of it, but if it leaks back, so you have to remember these things leaking back into your blood because of in toxic bile theory, we talk about cholestasis. All these things that are in the bile, instead of going in your gut and staying there and being pooped out or reabsorbed and going straight to the liver and not into the blood, if they leak into your main bloodstream, your peripheral bloodstream, if you want to call it that, you have copper floating around in your bloodstream now. You have vitamin, old stored vitamin D from your liver floating around in your bloodstream like supplements you may have taken, and vitamin A coming out of your liver. Copper depletes potassium. Vitamin D3 supplements deplete potassium. I have research in rats showing it. And um, vitamin A blocks potassium channels. So you could have normal potassium levels in your system and have potassium deficiency symptoms because it's not getting back inside the cell. Okay? So, um, Let's see. <laughs> Joe's taking a bathroom break. Um, so yeah, so the, uh, Gianni, Gianni, that's that's what we got. But it just be aware if you if you jumped up too fast, yes, it can cause this. And if you, it, especially if you have, a, if you had kind of like a subclinical or an underlying potassium deficiency or a tendency towards that, and then the niacin dumps a bunch of toxic stuff out and it depletes your potassium even more, that could be it. So like. Folks, those of you who are in the program and those of you who are thinking of going in the program and you're going to read the nicotinic acid stuff, this is something that's coming up over and over and over again. The only buffering agents that are okay are specifically mentioned in the articles. I have people coming to me and saying, I'm buffering with magnesium chloride. And I'm like, no, no. No, that's not a buffer. That doesn't work. Neither does potassium chloride. Neither does potassium citrate. The specific buffers are mentioned in the articles. Please do not go cowboy. You don't understand the chemistry like Kelsey does. So please read the articles and follow them. And don't just think that taking a mineral with your nicotinic acid is buffering it. That's not how this works. Please follow the instructions. I'm getting tired of having people come to me and saying they're using chlorides as buffers. And they're like, I don't know. I don't understand why I don't, why, why it's not working. And I'm like, cause follow the instructions, please. Save yourself first and then save me the time and maybe Kelsey the time of having to redo it. Go back and read those articles again. Okay, so let's go look. So Gianni, Gianni, I hope that answered your question. Will, oh, sorry, Will, I missed your super chat. Does this count as a question? It, it has a question mark. So yes, we're going to count as a question. Thanks for the super chat, Will. <laughs> so, okay. So let's see. Um, okay, Mathe asked... What is my theory on what the niacin flush really is and why that happens? Now, Kelsey has some 
TRPV, TPRV theories on what it is. Kelsey and I have talked about this and we kind of agree on what the flush is. So I'm going to try to explain this. So, so nobody else out there that I know of has a good theory of what the niacin flush is. Not even <laughs> the aggressively uh, opinionated DK out there that, that I've heard of. I haven't seen it. Nobody has a good explanation. Now, let me explain what I believe it is. And it absolutely has to do with aldehydes and vitamin A stored in the skin and the subcutaneous fat. So first, let us go over acute vitamin A poisoning. Like let's say somebody ate polar bear liver or seal liver or whatever. The, the kind of things that would cause it, I, I believe in um, Inuit societies, Eskimo, they called it pick block toe or pick block talk, which is schizophrenia induced by eating polar bear liver, seal liver, too many fish, too many high vitamin A fatty fish found in Arctic waters. It's a well-known phenomenon. Women, especially running around like naked in the snow, screaming, like it's, it's bad. So what are the symptoms in the skin that happen after somebody has an acute overdose of vitamin A? Like when the guys, uh, I, I posted about this, they got stuck out in the, in the like frozen tundra and they ate their sled dogs. And one of the guys who was in worse shape, his buddy fed him the liver because he thought he was being nice. And he's like, well, it's the softest piece of meat I can give him. He was trying to be nice. And he poisoned the guy. The other guy got more poisoned and he died. One guy lived and the other guy died because he gave him the liver. So the symptoms in the skin that come about in an acute vitamin A overdose after time, the skin will get very red. It will get painful. It will get itchy. Obviously, there's going to be tingling in there. And then eventually, as it passes, as you get on the other side of it, you peel. They call it desquamation in the literature. Desquamation is peeling. So, redness, oh, sorry, heat. Redness, heat, itchiness, tingling, pain, followed by eventually as it's starting to resolve, you get the, the peeling or the dry skin. It's very bad dry skin where you're peeling, okay? Does this sound familiar to another process that anybody may have been through in their life? like a sunburn. So a sunburn, redness, heat, itching, tingling, burning, stinging, eventually followed by desquamation or peeling. Is this not the exact same presentation? Okay. So when that happens, what does, what does sunlight or UVB do to vitamin A in your skin? It oxidizes it, which is the detox pathway of vitamin A. That is how our body breaks down vitamin A so it can get rid of it. But the problem is, as you go through the stages of vitamin A detoxification, vitamin A actually becomes more toxic. It's called a process called biotransformation. You can look it up or some people call it intoxication. Okay. So it's very strange that when some, somebody overdoses on vitamin A and then what would their body start doing? It would store a lot of it. It couldn't put it all in the liver. So it puts a lot of it in the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. And then as it detoxes, how does it store it in the fat and the subcutaneous tissues? It stores it as retinyl esters. Retinol bound to a fatty acid ester. Okay. So then as you start detoxing it, it, it comes out of the fat. Your bo the body chops off the ester, the fatty acid, and it turns the retinol, an alcohol, through... Um, ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase, it turns it into retinaldehyde. Now, my theory 
is that retinaldehyde, that process of going from retinol to retinaldehyde in very high doses at once is what causes the redness and the tingling and the itching and the burning. And then as it progresses on, as it starts to turn into retinoic acid, then you get the dry skin. Many of you who have done Accutane know about the dry skin, you know about the dry eyes, you know about the dry mouth. Well, that was retinoic acid. So this is the theory, right? You get a vitamin A overdose. Well, your body's going to start detoxing it. It's going to detox it really fast. You're going to see signs of really high doses of vitamin A in those areas as it goes through the process. Sunburn, you get too much sun in your skin. It oxidizes the retinyl esters in your skin. Some of them are going through that process, turning into retinaldehyde. So what, what's the first phase of a sunburn, right? Redness, tingling, burning, itching, that stuff. And what's the later phase? Peeling. So niacin as nicotinic acid or flush niacin, the flush has to happen for this detox to be happening. It provides the cellular, uh, it provides the energy, the NAD plus to run alcohol dehydrogenase and to run aldehyde dehydrogenase. So you just took something that is going to ramp up your detox enzymes, your oxidizing detox enzymes, ramp them up very fast. So then you go through all the stages of that vitamin A detox in your skin. You go through the redness and the tingling and the itching. You don't usually have pain in your skin. And then in the early phases of getting all that toxicity out of your skin, you may have a little bit of dry skin. That's normal. I mean, it's part of the detox. But that goes away. As long as you drink some, you know, make sure you're getting enough hydration and, you know, some people may need to up their fat a little bit during that time, but it goes away. And as you go on in time, as you've taken the niacin longer, the flushes tend to get less intense. Why does the flush keep happening? Somebody might say, well, well, why would you flush one day and detox your skin and then flush again the next day? Why is your skin toxic again? Well, you're still leaking bile into your blood. If you still have health issues, you're still leaking bile into your blood. That bile goes into your blood. And what does your body do? So after you finish flushing until the next day when you flush, where is that toxic bile that's in your blood? Some of it being stored. It's being stored in your skin and subcutaneous fat. So then when you do the flush again, you flush again because you've refilled that toxicity in your skin. It's coming out of your liver, which is good. And it's going to your skin and then your body's running it through those detox enzymes, the dehydrogenases. So that is the only viable theory I've ever heard of a niacin flush. And this is why it looks and feels exactly like an extremely rapid like an hour or two versus like when you get a sunburn or you get acute vitamin A overdose, it's like one to two weeks. We're talking about one hour, two, two hours at most. This is an accelerated detox process. Now, the other thing that people notice about the flush, if, if, if the refilling of your skin and subcutaneous fat with toxins from the leaky bile is true, it would make sense that if you did the niacin flush, if you broke it up into more times in a day, there would be less time for it to refill, right? And what people start to notice is when they do multiple flushes in a day, the flushes go down or they don't even show up. How many of you guys out there have noticed that? So this is the theory of the niacin flush. And I don't know of anybody who's come out with anything even close. And yes, it is vitamin A detox in your skin and other aldehydes. So that's what I got. Okay, let me see. We got another super chat. Okay, Pat says blood draw 2824. My homocysteine is 14 micromoles per liter. 
Your doctor wants you to take methyl guard thorn. Also, your A1C is 5.9 on the low vitamin A, minerals, nicotinic acid, mag lotion, sun fiber, also serapeptase. So taking thorn methyl guard is... Ugh. We don't, we don't, I mean, I don't usually go over labs here, Pat, I, but I also don't treat labs because they're, they're symptoms, right? Your homocysteine, where it is, is a symptom. It's not a cause. They want to say it's inflammation and all this stuff. And we go, it may be an indicator of stuff going on, but we don't necessarily trying to push that down. I mean, I've, I've had people where they take methylated B vitamins and they were like the worst thing to ever happen to them. Throwing methyl groups around the methylation problems, <laughs> niacin will fix. Let me, let me tell you about methylation and, and niacin. Oh, this is fun. Cause Kelsey and I talked about this too. And Kelsey's explanation was great. So I used to be into methylation. I used to be into the whole methylation idea, Walsh, and all that stuff. And I used to do with clients, some of you may have been with me during those days where I was doing, I would do a questionnaire about methylation symptoms. I would do blood tests of like homocysteine. And what was the other one I would do? Oh, histamine. And I would also look at GGT. And then we would also do a niacin flush test. The idea was, if you took a small dose of niacin and you flushed like 50 milligrams, I'm talking 50 milligrams. We start most people at 25. If you took 50 milligrams of niacin and you flushed, you were considered a strong under methylator. And you know, you're genetically wired this way. This is the biggest horse shite I've ever heard. Because as Kelsey pointed out, she said, well, how does your methylation fix itself then if? So if I used to flush at 50 milligrams, and if I were to tell you on one day, I took 20 grams of nicotinic acid. Am I recommending this? No. What I did, I, am I telling anybody to do this? No. I took 20 grams of nicotinic acid in one day and I didn't flush. What happened to my methylation problem? Where, where did it go? Why did it disappear? Why am I taking 4,000 times as much niacin as I started with for one day only? That's all. I only took it for one day and I didn't flush. Is my methylation fixed? Is methylation a toxicity and deficiency problem? Yes. So, yeah. I would suggest, Pat, that you are, that you are, fo you put your focus more on the nicotinic acid and the buffering and that stuff. And we know that vitamin A and homocysteine go up together. So we're working on obviously a low vitamin A diet. You're doing the nicotinic acid, do the buffer, you know, whatever. I personally like magnesium carbonate as my buffer the most. Um, potassium bicarbonate would be the second and baking soda or sodium bicarbonate would be the third because honestly, most people, you're getting plenty of sodium in your diet. You don't need to add more sodium as a buffer. I've even got zinc niacinate or zinc nicotinate in here. Thanks to Kelsey. We're going to be coming out with crazy supplements and all sorts of cool stuff. So yeah, I, I, the A1C looks, I, as far as I know, I don't, I don't even look at A1C. I just, I, these other labs, homocysteine, A1C, I fix these in people as they give it enough time, but I never look at the labs. We do a totally different approach here, which is we're not, we're trying to fix the entire system. We're not trying to just make your labs look better. I did that. 
I did the whole functional nutrition thing where you would, you would, uh, people would obsess, practitioners obsess over labs and they just go, oh, this lab's too high or too low here, this supplement. Oh, this lab's too high or this low here, this supplement. They are simply, they, this is the most allopathic. They think they're being like alternative and treating the cause because they're using a natural supplement to force a lab in a direction. Their philosophy is broken. They're doing allopathic medicine. They're saying, if it's too hot, make it cold. If it's too wet, make it dry. If this is high, make it lower. If this is low, make it higher. And some of you might say, well, you do that with, with minerals. And I'm like, minerals are essential. <laughs> Most of the supplements they're using, 99% of them are not essential nutrients. And if you're trying to use mega doses of B vitamins, the best thing that those are doing, the best, and I don't mean this is a good thing, they're antidoting toxicity that's already in you. So what's the key thing then? Well, stop putting the toxicity in. So you don't have to antidote it, right? The, the key thing is not if you get bit by a snake, right? Yes, you want the anti-venom. Okay. But isn't it better to not get bit by the snake? Like wear some pants, right? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, so Pat, if you're, if you're working, I don't remember if you're working with Nathan or I, but if you are, you may want to go to the office hours. But again, these are things that tend to fix themselves over time as people do the program. So I don't have specific things. We don't, I, I just don't freak out over labs. Let me give you a quick example. The lady in the program who had diagnosed cirrhosis, diagnosed full on primary biliary cirrhosis. She was on Udka, the pharmaceutical bile acid, secondary bile acid. It is, it, it occurs in your body naturally. Tudka is taurine bound to Udka. They get that from, you know, bare bile or, or they synthesize it in the lab. Um, which is really funny. Nobody seems to care about where the Tudka comes from, but all these natural supposed people love it. Anyway, I said to her, I said, she's like, how am I going to fix this? I want to get off this medication. I said, if you trust me, she was working directly with me. I said, if you trust me, you're going to need to get off of that medication. And she said, every time I do, I've tried to get off of it before. Every time I do, my liver enzymes go up and my, my hepatologist freaks out and tells me I need to get back on them. And I said, well, you can either keep doing that cycle of getting off of them, your liver enzymes go up and then you get back on them and then you want to get off of them again and you can keep doing that. Or she's like, have, well, have you ever worked with anybody with cirrhosis before? And I said, no. And I said, I'm probably the best chance you got. And I think you know that. And she said, yes. I said, what you're going to need to do is just work the program and ride out those liver enzymes going up. Because what's a different concept that I use about liver enzymes here? Liver enzymes are an indicator of how hard your liver is working. When you think of it like that, like let's say somebody's an alcoholic and their liver enzymes are up. Their liver's working really, really hard. If somebody's taking lots of medications, pain medications, whatever, and their liver enzymes go up, their liver's working really, really hard because they're being poisoned. Does that make sense? So if let's say we're doing all the things right and we're taking the load off of the liver, well, if you're spring cleaning your house, is that easy or is that kind of hard? Well, it's kind of hard. It sucks. It's a lot of work, but your house is going to be cleaner when you're done. So sometimes if the liver's working hard and we're doing things right, it's because the liver is healing itself. And then as the liver heals itself, the spring cleaning is finished. And then you don't have the liver enzymes that the liver's not working so hard and then it comes back to normal, right? Spring cleaning ends. 
and then you go back to the normal maintenance of your house. So without this framework, and honestly, you know, most practitioners don't have the balls to do what I did. We've, we've got, we've got Grant and other people fixing chronic kidney disease and their kidney doctors have never seen it before. The, the hepatologist who works with this woman who fixed her cirrhosis, he's never seen anything like that before. She, he basically told her when she came into him, she's like, can this ever be fixed? And he's kind of like, he basically said, no, it's a death sentence. You're basically just going downhill until you're gone. This is the world that hepatologists live in. I'm so glad that I'm, I, I'm not one. I couldn't imagine working in a field that would be so depressing. Because, right, they're MDs, but they can't use pharmaceutical meds because people's livers are already shredded. What are they going to do? Don't drink alcohol. Like, that's the best thing they do. Oh, you could go donate some blood because you've got high ferritin. That's, those are their tricks. Sad. But anyway, so that's like, so what, even with those labs, Honestly, had I never known about her liver enzymes, it wouldn't have changed a dang thing I did. Grant didn't. Grant wasn't checking his kidney function, I don't think, all along the way when he was fixing it. Maybe he got a checkup every year, but did he change anything along the way? No, he wasn't trying to treat labs. We don't treat labs. We treat toxicities. We treat deficiencies. We give the body what it needs based on best is based on testing. And then the body heals itself and it fixes all those labs. That's, that's what we do. So I don't, I don't bandaid crutch treat labs. That's, that's green allopathy. They call that allopathic medicine is doing, you know, conventional medicine. They're just doing it with supplements. And lots of people in naturopathic medical school back when I was in it used to speak badly of that green allopathy. Oh, that's just, that's just green allopathy. And they, and they were right. But then what are most of them out there doing in practice now? They're doing it. They're doing green allopathy. So we, we're not doing that, but the mindset shift has to be there because we're not, we're not doing the same thing. So hope that helps. I would just, Stay the course and consider more nicotinic acid because nicotinic acid detoxes the stuff that the B vitamins are supposed to antidote. You want B12, eat more red meat. You want more folate, beans, and asparagus. There you go. Do not take B6. B6 is a, an aldehyde and an alcohol. It accumulates in your nerves. It'll give you neuropathy. You should have seen how many people on Twitter were commenting about how messed up they got taking B6 containing supplements. So yes, this includes multis. Yes, this includes B complexes. Don't take B6 supplements. Don't try to emphasize B6 in your diet. But they'll give it to you for homocysteine, won't they? Probably in that methyl guard. Don't. You do not want to, here would, here would be a horrible thing, wouldn't it? Trying to fix your homocysteine with a combination B vitamin methyl guard supplement and causing yourself to get a neuropathy from B6 toxicity at the same time. Wouldn't that be horrible? I mean, just shoot yourself in the foot. Why don't you? So I, no, I wouldn't do that. So we got that. Okay. Let's go find, did we have any, Joe, did we have another, um, super chat? But anyway, thank you for that question. Um, let me see. Oh, there it was. Yes. Thank you, Pat. Just making sure I didn't miss anything. Um, <laughs> Vince asks, does B6 cure homosexuality? Wow. That's a question. I'm not, I'm not going to touch that. I am not going to touch that. I think there are multiple avenues with how that happens. Some of them can be toxicity. Some of them can be trauma. I, that's not a topic I want to touch. Um, I don't think YouTube would really want me to touch that. 
either. So let me find the next question. Um, oh, and Kelsey said she's excited for the opportunity to help people with their flesh niacin. Yes. Kelsey, you know how I feel about you. You're, you're awesome. Um, Mathay says the only doctor I know of who will change his opinion when presented with the evidence against his own beliefs. Bravo on the 180 degree turnaround. I, that just a quick example for you folks. Like I was, I was doing, I think 2013. I thought vita vitamin D was the big vitamin D supplements and a low vitamin D causes everything. I bought into it, but I'm an early adopter, right? 2013 people are like, well, nobody was talking about vitamin D back then. I was, I was doing finger prick vitamin D tests, vitamin blood spot tests in my office. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want people to have to pay for a whole blood draw. And I didn't want to send them out to a lab just to get a vitamin D test when I could do a blood spot in my office. And I was putting them on vitamin D supplements. And then a year or two after that, I learned via hair analysis classes, what vitamin D did on hair tests. And the simple explanation was it drove everybody hypothyroid based on hair analysis theory. And you could watch it. So I got everybody off the vitamin D I'm having to, to my own clients. Like when I say most practitioners don't have the balls to do what I do, I was sitting there imagine coming in, somebody coming in to talk to me and I'm going, yeah, you know, that vitamin D I put you on, you need to stop it. It's toxic. I'm sorry. I put you on it. I have learned better. My bad. Get off of it. Don't ever take it again. Many people couldn't do that in their own professions, much less a medical profession. And then via hair testing, what hair analysis taught me was to give vitamin A to lower calcium. Kind of as like, so vitamin D would tend to raise calcium on a hair test, like way high. The highest I've ever seen was 700 on a hair test. You want it theoretically around 40. I'm not sure if it may actually be lower though. The optimal may be lower than 40. Highest calcium I ever had to fix was 700. You want it 40. 700. It took two and a half years of hammering at that calcium to get it to come down to a 40. We fixed it. If there's one thing I have, it's patience. This woman, how'd she get her calcium so high? She took cod fermented cod liver oil and normal cod liver oil and fermented cod liver oil, tablespoon a day. I don't know if she ever went above that, maybe two tablespoons for five years. Yeah. Don't do that. Cod liver oil is poison. But anyway, we fixed it. So vitamin A, once I realized that that was a poison, I had to go and tell everybody that I was working with, get off of it. It's toxic. That was after reading Grant Jenneru's book. Halfway through Grant Jenneru's first book, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I said, I have to, this, this is, this was the missing piece. So I changed that. And then recently Kelsey came into the love your liver program and we started chatting and we were on a podcast. I was on the, the podcast with her, um, the wellness superheroes. And I could, I recognized that she was very, very smart and we started talking and she explained more about nicotinic acid to me and flush niacin and she explained to me how those the, the eight case studies saying that crystalline nicotinic acid or flush niacin powdered flush niacin is bad for us and it's bad for your liver she explained how those were completely wrong they just like ignored the fact that these people may have been drinking tons of alcohol. They were, they were almost all on multiple medications. There was lots of things that could have been going on there. And yet, of course, it's the niacin's fault. Mm, sure. Right. So anyway, she explained all that to me. And then I decided to flip 180 on that. And then I have some people that are like, well, two years ago, you said that you didn't, or even six, I think it was maybe even eight months ago or something like that. You said niacin was toxic. And I'm like, yeah, back then I had bad information. 
I had incomplete information and I didn't know the differences between the forms of niacin. Now I do. And Kelsey herself even said, she's like, wow, you, you, you got this so fast. Like, I'm, I'm like, yeah, it all makes sense. Once you understand it, I, I don't know. I'm pretty quick at grokking things though. So, so yes, we will change. We change. We don't want to change on a regular basis. We don't want to be wishy-washy. We don't want to have a new, a new flavor of the month every week. When we're talking about, when we start to see the patterns of vitamin A is a toxin and vitamin D is a toxin and vitamin E probably toxic too. But vitamin K is in a totally different chemical category. They lump them all into the fat soluble vitamins, but vitamin D is an alcohol, vitamin A is an alcohol, vitamin E is an alcohol. That's why they all end in OLs. Whereas um, vitamin K is a quinone, totally different category. See, so we can, we can start to make these connections and move forward quicker. So, yeah. Um, so yes. And then, yeah, Will said, imagine changing your opinion when new data proves you wrong. This is, I don't know. Again, I'm only after the truth here, folks. I'm only after the truth. If I'm proven wrong, I don't know. Again, I, I have the guts to say, oops, I was wrong. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's not, it's not the end of the world, folks, especially for you, Peters. It's okay to realize you're wrong and that eating white sugar is not good for you. You can come to the other side. There's tons of people in the Love Your Liver program who were like, yeah, I was a dumb Peter once and that messed me up and now I'm not. How many of us did stupid diet approaches that made us sick? All of us. That's why you're here. Maybe you weren't sick at first and then you decided because the internet's like optimal health and wellness you're like oh i'm gonna bit get like super healthy and then you start doing stupid at af diets that made you sick when you weren't sick before how many of us did that like we weren't even sick and then the supposed optimal health diet ruined us I remember I, as a kid, like with all the BS that was out there, you want to know when, when I started getting into health as a kid, like 16, 15 years old, 16 years old, I got my mom to buy shredded wheat, right? The big, the big old biscuits. And I would put skim milk on it and I would sprinkle equal like NutraSweet on it. I thought I was being as health, like, like no fat, wheat, dairy, Artificial sweeteners, right? I'm super healthy. That was like, and then I was taking my Flintstones vitamin with it. Yeah, I know now why everybody's so sick from such a young age. But I was trying to be healthy and I started my downhill slide of health. And now we're here fixing it all. I have no problem admitting my mistakes because that's why I'm here fixing people now. So, okay. <laughs> Will joked, we don't vape nicotine. We snort nice. And no, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not even testing that out. If you want to test it, I, I, I'm, I'm not. Well, actually, Kelsey made a nasal spray. There's, there's nasal spray recipes inside the Love Your Liver program. So technically, yes, some people are snorting niacin, but they're making it in a nasal spray. I'd be care the powder, I wouldn't I wouldn't do that. So um Cass says my midwife is making me get an iron infusion and a B12 shot. What are your thoughts? I feel very iffy about it all. Well, pregnancy is I'll put it this way. Pregnancy is a topic that I'm not going to make too many comments on because this is a public forum and I don't need to hang my ass out in the wind to get my information twisted and turned on me and, and cause myself problems. So here is what I'll say about this. If someone was pregnant and they wanted to try a B12 shot, I wouldn't have any problem with them trying a B12 shot. See how you feel. Here's the thing about B12 shots, folks, is if you needed that B12 shot, 
you will feel different within about 10 to 20 minutes of getting it. It will change how you feel. No doubt. I, I was the B12 shot king of Tucson for like several years. I had a day in my practice where I gave 40 B12 shots in a day. I've done a lot of B12 shots. I've seen a lot of B12 shot responses. People who are like, oh, you need to get like three or four shots to feel it. No, you don't. No, you don't. One shot. I had one woman, she got a methyl B12 shot because I used to think methylated B vitamins were so good. She came back the next time and she said, I didn't sleep for three days. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want another shot? She said, well, yeah, after I, after I started sleeping, I had so much more energy. And I was like, okay. I was like, let's give you half as much. So we did. And she's, she comes back and she's like, well, I didn't sleep for a day, but I had so much energy after that. And I was like, okay, do you want to do it again? She said, yeah. I'm like, why don't we just give you like a quarter of a normal shot? Okay. Give her a shot. She's like, oh yeah, I was just a little tired for an hour. And then I had a bunch of energy. I was like, well, okay. So these things, you don't have to build up B12 in your system. If you get a shot and you feel better from it, then what your job would be then would be to try to figure out how long does the B12 shot feel like it lasts? How long does the improvement last? Don't get a shot again until it has worn off. Right? It's just, then you're not overdoing it. Also, with the iron infusion, I mean, okay, pregnancy is one of the hardest times in a woman's life. You know, only women get pregnant. Um, pregnancy is one of the hardest times in a woman's life because it is the most stress on your liver and it is self-induced. You're, you're, you are making, the analogy I do is like you are building a new person. You know how when they're like building a new house, they have like a whole the one of those roll off garbage bins by it to throw all the waste into like, think of it, you're making a new human, but there's all sorts of leftover products, waste products, hormones, toxicity is coming out of your liver at like a, an amazing rate. Like you should see women's copper levels during pregnancy are like off the charts. It's crazy. That this is why women, if you, the more toxic you are, when you go into pregnancy, the worse you feel because you're that toxicity is coming out of your liver. Your liver is trying to deal with all the hormones and all the stuff and it gets backed up and you back up stuff into your system. I've shown a paper here before where they said subclinical cholestasis. So they mean toxic bile leaking into your blood below the levels that medicine can figure out. It's a problem at can now be considered normal during pregnancy and then tons of kids, probably like 60 to 80% of kids are being born jaundiced these days because their mother's livers are so bad. What do we have in our program? We have hope giving birth to like, what is it? Your fourth or fifth child hope? I don't remember. And her labor was 10 minutes. No interventions, 10 minutes. This is what we're doing for women by making them less toxic. Now, Anemia of pregnancy, if you're eating, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you guys with this, folks. If you are eating red meat, a decent amount of red meat once a day, iron deficiency, if they try to say you're iron deficient anemia or you, you've got an iron deficiency, you might on the blood tests, but it's not because of a lack of it in your diet. It's your liver's messed up. Your liver is the big blood builder in your body. Your liver does everything important. So if you chronically have anemia, or if you chronically have high ferritin, you should watch the high ferrit the, the ferritin episode on here. But basically, iron problems are liver problems. Other people will try to say, oh, iron causes the liver to have problems. Well, if, if you do iron infusions, you should see it like I've, I've seen... Oh, I had a woman who got regular iron infusions because she had colitis. Her ferritin would jump from like a 20 to like a 550. 
She went from like deficient, way low on iron to like hemochromatosis, like iron overload. And then we would just watch it go down over the months. Guess what happened as we fixed her liver and she did the love your liver stuff and she worked with me on minerals. She stopped having to have iron infusions because her liver started fixing her blood. It's pretty cool. Your liver, when you fix your liver, your liver fixes everything else. So I... First of all, if you got, if you decided to get an iron infusion, you better feel better from it. If you're going to do it again, like you want it, you want to feel better from it. It shouldn't take very long. If you don't feel better from it, don't let them give it to you again. Cause obviously it didn't work, but personally, you know, somebody, you may want to, if you were going to eat more red meat, let's say, first of all, the highest iron, if you want, if you're picking red meat like steaks, because you can't really do this with hamburger. If you're picking red meat, if you want more zinc and more iron, this is the opposite of like what all the carnivores are doing. You want the lowest fat cuts. The lower fat, the cut of beef, the more zinc and the more iron that's in it. So if you're getting ribeyes, they're not going to have as much zinc in them as I don't, I don't know, a top sirloin maybe, or some really like a flank steak. Those are really lean. Um, but anyway, you can just look up the leanest cuts of meat in general. Make sure they're, you know, grass fed and not, you know, corn fed and soy fed and all that stuff. But yeah, that's, a, a, a true iron problem generally in the blood is a liver problem. And during pregnancy is a really, really hard time to start fixing this. I generally tell people like, don't start your vitamin A detox. Well, uh, sorry, if, you, if you're not pregnant, do six months of the detox, of the vitamin A detox stuff, the love your liver stuff before you get pregnant. And if you're, if you're already pregnant, sure, you could start reducing your vitamin A. And there's some other things that I might do with somebody who was working directly with me, mineral-wise. But we do not start trying to push detox really hard during pregnancy because you dump a bunch of toxic stuff out of your liver. And because I take responsibility for people, I'm not going to have you dump a bunch of toxicity into your blood that then can affect the fetus. I, I won't do that. I will not take that responsibility. Like I'm not, I'm not going to push detox on people while they're pregnant. So if you try it, try it once you better feel better from it. And I would try to separate them so you can see what does what, you know, separate them by, I don't know. Like if you go and you get the B12 shot and the iron infusion on the same day, you're not going to know what did anything. If you did a B12 shot, gave it like two or three days afterwards and then did the iron infusion, then you can tell because the B12 shot, you'll notice that day. So, okay. Let's see. Um, yeah, Cass, Cass was saying she doesn't know what else to do. She, the, the midwife said you'll have to deliver at the hospital after you paid her a lot of money. If if the midwife was saying, you know, do this or I won't deliver you at home, you have you have a, a choice to make. You could talk to the midwife and say, look, I'll do one of these, one of each of these. And if I don't feel better, I'm not doing any more. The midwife should be fine with that. Like, because if, if you don't feel better, then why keep doing it? Um, I mean, my, my first child, we were planning on doing a home birth and my, my ex's water broke and the, the midwife came, the nurse midwife, we had a certified nurse midwife. She came and she said, this baby's not coming for a long time. 
And she's like, I need to put her on antibiotics, like IV antibiotics right now. Me being in medicine and knowing my ex-wife and how anxious and tight in terms of stuff, I was like, if the midwife says this is going to be a long time and she has to do IV antibiotics in case we have to go to the hospital later, you know, my ex puts lots of trust in MDs. That's part of one of the reasons she's an ex. But also I looked at it and I said, if, if, if this is looking risky, go ahead. Now it ended up that she had to get IV antibiotics like every 12 hours until she finally, her first water broke and she delivered 48 hours later in the hospital. We tried it at home. 36 hours at home, the last 12 hours in the hospital. Still no cesarean, no episiotomy. Yes, she did get an epidural. Yes, she did get some Pitocin. And yes, the certified nurse midwife was there the whole time, as was I. And we got our amazing baby girl out of it. So sometimes you got to make decisions you may not want to do to get what you want. One of the greatest things a midwife ever said to me, she said it during this, we were, this was about, this was right before we went to the hospital. She said, you know, Garrett, the only time I have problems with home births is when I say, I think we should go to the hospital and the parents insist on staying home, even though I've said it's time to go. And, you know, I'm a naturopathic doctor, right? I, I want to do it at home. But I looked at her. I looked at my ex. Looked back at her. I could tell how tired my ex was. That's a long story in itself. And I said, okay, we're, we're going to the hospital. This is not even a decision anymore. So don't let, don't let your desires get in the way of you having a, the birth that you want. Like if you could stay at home, if you could trade an iron infusion and a B12 shot to, to, to do a home birth instead of a hospital birth, I'd, I'd trade that. I would, I, what you decide to do Cass is up to you, but I would probably trade that. So we could, so we could do a home birth. Our second home birth was three and a half hours of, of labor. And then it was done. So I think the X just, had relaxed a little bit since she'd done it before, you know, anyway. Um, okay. So trusty rusty asks, they say not to eat too close to bed, but when I don't eat after six, I seem to have trouble sleeping. I suspect it has to do with blood sugar or something. Any thoughts on this? Well, first of all, you'd want to watch the hydration video in the love your liver program. I cover a lot about how to manage sleep with hydration and foods carbs, salt, water, all that stuff. So normally I will, I will say this going to bed with a full stomach is it feels terrible and usually you won't sleep well, but if, if you don't eat after six and you have trouble sleeping, then you just simply need to listen to you. Like your blood sugar stability may not be as good as you want it to be yet. So you may have to eat a snack before bed to have you sleep. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Over time, the blood sugar stability will fix itself if you're doing the right things and you won't have to do that. It could also be you may just not be eating enough. Don't ever forget that this can be a problem, folks. If you don't eat enough food in general, you're not going to sleep very well. You could stuff yourself and not sleep well, but you could also not eat enough food and not sleep well. So... um. Yeah, I would just I would just adjust your eating to help you sleep. Whatever you need to do at this point. But I would definitely watch the hydration video in the Love Your Liver program. Some people have told me that that was like worth the whole price of admission. That one video. Okay. Let's see. He 
So Cass just added, she said, I'm an extremely high risk of hemorrhaging because my ferritin is very low. But my hemoglobin is 12.5 and all my iron is extremely high because she's been making me supplement it. This is a liver. Your liver makes ferritin. Ferritin is a protein made by your liver. Sometimes there's iron in it. Like it's made to hold iron, but you can have ferritin floating around that doesn't have any iron in it. Um, if it were, if, if I was told that somebody had a very high risk of hemorrhaging, well, I sure would be personally doing some vitamin K2 as either MK4 or K1 or a combination of both. That's just what I would be doing. So. Sydney says that's, she was talking about the asparagus. She says that's really interesting because I also really like asparagus. Um, Stugtron says I'll totally get asparagus back in my diet. Wasn't sure if it was good or not. I just, I feel amazing. I think, I think there's something. I'm going to use this fun, stupid term magic. There's something magical about asparagus. I don't know what it is The the whole, like, I think it gets you to pee out more sulfur than you take in. And that's why the asparagus smell of your pee. Uh, asparagus also funny thing that, that the asparagus smell of your pee smells a lot like B1. B1 is a sulfur containing vitamin. So there's plenty of B1 in asparagus. We'll put it that way. Okay. Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah. Will posted a paper, Effects of Niacin on Biliary Lipid Output in the Rat. And that link's in there. And uh, Will also says, y'all don't want to see the amounts of niacin. Some of us in his detox chat, he has a Telegram group, are doing. I didn't even tell them to do that either. LOL. We've, okay. Multiple people in the past, let's say, especially guys, will take too much zinc. And at the start, they feel amazing and they think they've figured something out. It's always, at, okay, folks, if you start doing something, you're like, oh my gosh, I figured this thing out and Dr. Smith doesn't talk about it. I figured it out. This is amazing. And then about a week or two later, your ass is getting handed to you because you're overdosing. That's when I smile and I say, did you read the articles? Did, did you miss the part where I warned you not to do too much? And you thought you were going to be like big tough guy and overdo it. And somehow I missed out on the overdoing it. Let me put it to you this way. I didn't miss out on the overdoing it. Did you hear me say I did 20 grams of nicotinic acid in one day? I test these things at high doses so I can figure out what happens at high doses for you. And then people are like, oh, Dr. Smith doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to, I'm going to kick my own ass with this. And I go, yeah, you did kick your own ass. Yeah. Zinc toxicity is a legit thing. Yeah. You could dry, you can put too much zinc in the system. Yeah, of course. Nicotinic acid. We've had people who were like doing high doses and they're like, this is going great. This is going great. This is going great. Wham. <laughs> kick their own ass. There's a reason we put these limp. You, you can still get, okay. Do you understand if you're driving somewhere? You could drive there. If we're talking American speeds, right? You could drive there at 65 miles an hour, or you could drive there at a hundred miles an hour. You're still going to get there at 65 miles an hour. But if you decide to drive a hundred miles an hour and you take your eyes off the road or somebody else does something or something unexpected happens, then you're rolling on the side of the road and you're, you're a wreck. All because you wanted to get there just a little faster. Happens all the time. Especially to men who think they're invincible and they're going to be the toughest dude whoever's done this program and they're going to take more than anybody else who's ever done the program. And they're going to prove them all wrong and then I just sit back and I go, let me know when that, uh, let me know when that doesn't work out because you drive at a hundred miles long enough, 
something's going to happen. Like I was watching this idiot on his motorcycle weaving in and out of traffic yesterday. I'm like, that dude's going to be a splatter on the road soon enough. You make one small mistake and you're toast. So this is the same thing with overdoing supplements, right? Your health problems are caused by your toxic bile leaking into the system. If you push it too hard, you dump more toxic bile, you leak the same amount into the system, but now you're dumping more bile, which means you have more bile in your system. And then you wonder why you feel bad. Because you took the problem and you exacerbated it because you were greedy and not patient. How do I know all this stuff? Gosh, Dr. Smith, how'd you figure all this stuff out? Because I did it to myself. Stop doing it. I mean, if, if you're if you're like the little child who has to feel the stove and burn their hand before you realize that when I warned you the stove was hot, don't touch it, and you just got to touch the stove yourself, I mean, go ahead. But realize that's coming, so you stop touching the stove quicker. You don't get as bad a burn, okay? Burns are dose-dependent. Okay. Josh asks, can niacin cause gout if overdone? Gout is a bile problem. I went over that in one of my, my live streams. So could you dump too much bile and aggravate gout symptoms with it? Yes. Could niacin aggravate, if you do flush niacin too hard and you don't buffer it and you don't use charcoal appropriately and you just decide again to do too much, it could aggravate any problem you have and potentially push like something that was underlying that was almost there, push it into view. Yeah. It doesn't mean it caused the problem. It means that it's the problem is related to too much bile. And if you dump too much bile, you leak more bile and then you get the symptoms that go along with that toxic bile. If somebody had a molybdenum deficiency, they're not going to be running their xanthine oxidase very well. And then that's going to cause more of a gout issue too. So Joe asks, is Chinese tea also toxic like coffee or is a better alternative to coffee? Oolong or per tea? If those are made by the Camellia sinensis plant, I believe Oolong is. If they are Camellia sinensis, the tea plant, they're not any less toxic than other teas. I mean, maybe American tea is like grown in extra high fluoride soil so they can dumb us down. But I don't know about, I mean, I don't know that I'd trust China grown tea either. <laughs> so uh, the only teas that I'm okay with on a regular basis, like if you go out to eat once in a while and you get an, you get an iced tea with lemon or something like that, I'm, that's once in a while. It's a hell of a lot better than getting a soda. So if you wanted to do that once, once in a while, that wouldn't be an issue. But like drinking tea every day, the only teas I, I kind of approve for daily use would be roasted barley tea or dandelion root. Dandelion root, not leaf, root tea. Do not use dandelion leaf. Super duper high in vitamin A. But just like a banana where the skin might be super high in vitamin A, the banana itself is not. So you can, the dandelion root is white. Dandelion leaves are green and full of vitamin A. They're kind of greenish yellow, aren't they? They have kind of a yellow tint to them. They have tons of vitamin A. So we don't ever touch the leaves. Okay. Mimu Chan asks, can Dr. Smith explain how niacin lowers cholesterol and triglycerides? by fixing the liver and helping detox. Cholesterol and triglycerides, I've shown before, triglycerides are go directly up with vitamin A toxicity. And as I just explained earlier, the niacin flush is a in what I believe is a direct vitamin A detox process. So if vitamin A raises triglycerides, nicotinic acid would lower them by lowering the vitamin A. Uh, Mimu says, must people take high doses greater than one gram to get this effect or will consistent but lower doses also help? Thanks. I I mean, it's, it's the example I just gave about like the car. Do I think you'll get there eventually? 
Yes. My last cholesterol test was 174. Again, I'm going to go over these labs soon. Um, but I used to run 280. I was Mr. Vitamin A poison. So I used to run a total cholesterol of 280. My total cholesterol now is 174. It's maybe lower than that now, now that I've been doing the uh, nicotinic acid longer. So I can't remember, Kelsey, if you're still here, um, you might want to add what the cholesterol and triglycerides doses are. Like you said, Mimu, it is kind of over one gram. I think it's 1500 milligrams is the, pay attention here, folks. 1500 milligrams. I hope I didn't say grams. 1500 milligrams a day is kind of the, the cholesterol and triglycerides dosing of nicotinic acid. Now that would be a buffered dose in our world. You would not be taking 1500 milligrams without buffering. No, you need to buffer that. So could you, you know, would over time, let's say you did 250 milligrams a day. Would that, I mean, that would take you six days of that to get 1500. So could you do it faster with 1500? Sure. Might 1500 cause more bile dumping? Sure. Might you be fine? Sure. We don't really know until we do it. So if you wanted faster results, you know, you might need to um, push a little harder. But then again, you know, there's, there's risk of more, you know, aggravating the detox dumping too much. So you kind of got to pick and choose your, your, what, what's the saying from fight club? You choose your level of involvement. You decide how deep you want to go, how fast and realize that driving the car faster has a higher risk of wrecking the car and then having to figure it all out again. So, okay. But the, if you want the mechanism of how it lowers it, I don't know that. Kelsey might know that more, but it's basically just fixing the liver. LDL cholesterol contains vitamin A. So we have research showing triglycerides go up with vitamin A supplementation, and we know that LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, contains vitamin A. We now know that nicotinic acid, I've shown the research in the, in the Love Your Liver program, nicotinic acid actually lowers vitamin A in the system. It detoxes vitamin A. This is how all these are connected. I don't, I will never know the mechanism. I don't care. I don't have to. I just want it out of people. So mechanisms, too many people get hung up on mechanisms. Mechanisms are conventional medicine. That's what they want you to focus on. That's why they're looking at receptors and viruses and have, has medicine gotten any better since they've started focusing smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller? Has medicine gotten any better? It's gotten worse. Why do they go smaller and smaller and smaller? So they can hide toxicity from you because they're only looking at one cell. They're not looking at those cells reproducing over time and carrying the toxicity along with them. And then you have people who like, throw out epidemiological studies. They just completely throw them out. They're like, that's epidemiological. You can't, can't use that. And I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, you could throw out a lot of epidemiological studies, but to throw them all out, like my eggs thread, where I show how toxic, like eating more than two eggs a week is in country after country, after country, after country to throw all that out is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But some people want to do that. And then they wonder why nobody's telling them why everybody's getting sick. And I'm like, well, because you got to look for the patterns within, within the big patterns. Got to be able to suss it out. So anyway, okay. Um, Vasil says, I take charcoal with niacin, taurine, and coffee. Get zero sides from the coffee this way. Normally, I become a total wreck after even a week coffee. Probably the bile gets absorbed in the charcoal. When you take coffee with high polyphenols in it, the polyphenols and the nicotinic acid are competing for the same receptors. The G is it, is it uh, Kelsey? Correct me if I'm wrong, but the GPR 109A receptors 
they are competing for the same receptors. So it wouldn't surprise me that if you took the nicotinic acid and the caffeine at the same time, you'd have less effects from the caffeine because it's not hitting as many receptors because the nicotinic acid and the caffeine are, and the, and the polyphenol, sorry, the polyphenols are competing for those receptors. You're basically, you're not undoing the effects of the nicotinic acid, but you're making the nicotinic acid positive effect less. And you're, you're, you may be making the negative effect of the coffee less, but you're also making the positive effect of the nicotinic acid less. If that's how you want to do it, that's fine. Like, I mean, 80% effective is not quite as good as hundred percent, but it's still 80%. If that's just to pick up numbers, just to pick out numbers. So. Um, wait, Kelsey posted a drive, a Google drive file link. I don't know what that's for. Um, oh my God. Susan Stewart said at Cass, my friend's midwife recommended pig's blood cubes in broth. It's TCM looks like tofu worked when nothing else did. feel like I'm going to throw up. Um, I get, I mean, uh, whatever. So, oh, you're welcome, Johnny. Johnny. Oh, Kelsey, the, the Kelsey posted that, that drive link in the chat, in the live chat. Uh, she said that's the niacin bile dumping in humans, uh, list of papers. So what about 1139? Um, Oh, Kelsey was showing up to four times more bile than Epsom salts, which is used for the infamous liver and gallbladder flush. So Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. We don't use that here because we don't need to absorb more sulfur and slow down detox. Sulfur slows your detox. Do not believe all the people out there saying, you need sulfur to run detox. You have no shortage. If you eat red meat, you have no shortage of sulfur in your diet. There is no such thing as a sulfur deficiency. And then people will say, but what about sulfation and all this stuff? And I'm like, oh, you know, vitamin A toxicity slows sulfation. So why don't we fix that instead of trying to take more sulfates, which slow down detox along the way? Like there were people in the past in the vitamin A detox program who thought they were real smart and they, they just couldn't wrap their head around toxicities and deficiencies causing all of this. They just had to keep pumping in the sulfur. And most of them are real angry and bitter and just trying to poke holes in this all the ways they could because they don't have the balls to admit they were wrong. Some of them could go as far as vitamin A is a poison. Okay, they could accept that, but they couldn't accept being lied to as much as we are in all of nutrition. Some people just don't have it. Susan says, Will, what she, they were talking about, uh, Will said lithium in tap and well water causes hypercalcemia, decreases intracellular potassium. And then Susan Stewart said, Will, that explains why I know two people who took lithium carbonate is the prescription drug and now have chronic kidney, kidney something. She didn't finish the thing. Chronic kidney disease, chronic kidney problems. Lithium is not an essential mineral. If you supplement it, like it, they use lithium to shut down bipolar. What do you think it's doing? It's probably shutting down bile or changing the bile recipe. I, I tried lithium in practice. You know what it did? It made a bunch of people have to pee all the time. Oh, kidney problems. Huh? That's all I saw out of lithium. I used lithium in practice. Lithium orotate. The magical orotate minerals. Those suck. The orotate minerals absolutely suck. When I tell you I've tried these things in practice and I, I come about to zinc picolinate for a reason, I tried all the zincs. I tried zinc orotate. I tried zinc monomethionine. I tried zinc glycinate. I tried all of them. I even tried, what's the one for, for ulcers? Uh, pepsin, GI, the, the zinc. Uh, what's, the, what's the one for ulcers? 
I can't remember. It's only dosed in like seven milligrams. Anyway, that doesn't raise zinc levels at all, even if people are taking like six or eight or 10 pills of it a day. Zinc carnosine, that's what it is, zinc carnosine. Yes, doesn't work at all to raise zinc levels at all. So let's see. Oh, Lenart says, hey, Dr. Smith, amazing mustache. Well, thank you. So the, the mustache, I'll just explain it again. Well, first of all, I've had multiple people tell me that I can pull off the mustache and they're, they're like, most guys can't, you can. And I, I take that as a big compliment. My kids don't like it. Some other people in my life don't really like it. Of course, nobody's going to like everything. But what happened was my beard clipper, the comb, the attachment on it broke. And so I, I had messed up my beard. So then I just decided I'd been wanting to have a mustache try it out again for a while. And so I just decided to roll with it. And I think I get the, the beard trimmer comb this week. It should be arriving any day now. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll go back to the beard. I don't know. I kind of like having the mustache. So, and then as, as who was it? I, uh, John, John Dickinson said, he's like, it really plays into the uh, detective thing. So I don't know. I'm having fun with it, but thank you very much for the, uh, the compliment. Leonard asks, what do you think about spermidine? I probably know it already, but would still appreciate your wisdom. I don't, I have not looked into it at all. Um, I've heard something about it lately. Let me go. What, well, no, what, what, Leonard, can you expand on what you, what, topics you think it would be useful to look up because like if i just go and i type in spermidine it's going to be like all the bs that comes up from duck duck go google whatever so i gotta i gotta know what to look into it i could do one thing and we're gonna if any of you guys I, i'm gonna go check for super chats but if any of you guys have super chats um May want to get them in because we're going to wrap it up here in like 15 minutes. You know me, 15 minutes goes away pretty quick. Okay, Joe, can you show my other screen? There we go. So I just decided to go, if you can see my uh, spermidine bile PubMed, I just, I just decided to go and try this to see if it had anything to do with bile. Spermidine ameliorates non-alcoholic steatohepatitis through thyroid hormone responsive protein signaling and the gut microbiota mediated metabolism of bile acids. Don't, I just put this paper up. That doesn't mean go and start putting a bunch of spermidine in your mouth. Okay. <laughs> we had a fun time in the inner circle last week going over the actual research science of female ejaculation. Those were some fun papers to go over. So yeah, we have, we have no, we have no limits on actually looking at real science. So Okay, so what do we have here? We found that daily spermidine intake was significantly lower in volunteers with liver dysfunction than the healthy controls. And the serum and fecal spermidine levels were negatively correlated with the NASH phenotypes, the expressions of the non-alcoholic. That's just basically fatty liver in people who aren't alcoholics, okay? Well, they're not talking about how long... I don't see how long the paper, how long the study was. And do we have the full paper? There it is. Nope. This is probably not the full paper. They're teasing us. Hold on. Joe wants the link. Joe's always demanding the link. <laughs> Joe is so demanding. Um, there we go. Let's put that there. At 
back here. Okay. Let's see if we got the whole thing. Nope. So, let me go, hold on, let me see if we can get this on Sci-Hub. Because I want to see if this is a, if this is a significant period of time that they supplemented it. it. Didn't have issues. No, it's not coming up. Wait, I put in the wrong thing. Let's do the title. See if we can get the title. Let's try the DOI. Go back there. Oh, no. no. Let's try the title. Sometimes you can find these things by using the different, using the title or the DOI or the PubMed ID. Oh, so and they did it in mice. Okay, so spermidine supplementation significantly attenuated, reduced hepatic lipid accumulation, that's fatty liver, insulin resistance, hepatic inflammation, and fibrosis in uh, fatty liver mice induced by a Western diet. Hmm. Spermidine altered the profile of hepatic bile acids and microbial composition and function. So it's changing the recipe of the bile. We talk about that a lot here. Furthermore, spermidine reversed the progression of hepatic steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis in mice with pre-existing NASH. So, I'm going to warn you. I'm going to warn you that when, when you see things like when they give mice cholestasis, they give them toxic leaky bile problems. If they give them things that shut down bile production then they're like, oh, look at how good the, the liver is fixing itself. Because they simply stopped the bile coming out, so the bile couldn't back up and blow out the system. So you can make these things look better by giving something that's toxic. So I would have to see, just so you know, I would have to see a lot more research and more long-term stuff on spermidine if this came out to be true. Like what? Okay, let's look at... Let's do this. Foods highest spermidine. Oh, look at them. They're so happy. Oh, uh, let's just toss these all out, basically. Beef. Wheat germ will poison you with manganese. This is just straight, not even worth dogs. This is a vitamin A problem. I don't eat fungus. Peas are generally high in vitamin A. Chicken liver is high in vitamin A. High in vitamin A. High in sulfur. Probably high in oxalates. Um, yeah, I see the super chat, Joe. I'll get, I'll get to that. So anyway, beef. Imagine beef being a staple of our program. So, the supplement spermidine. Oh, super smart. I, I've, I've used some products from them before. Three grams of spermidine a day, which is the same as... What were they saying here? Get out of the way. So, like, what, how much was in beef? 3.7 milligrams per 100 grams. But they make sure to tell you don't eat red meat because, you know, Klaus Schwab and the World Health Organization doesn't like you being strong and healthy. I wonder why they call it spermidine. Let's look that up. Why do they, why is it called spermidine? So, I mean, they named it spermidine for some reason. Ah, there it is. 
Dutch scientist Anton van Leeuwenhoek initially discovered spermidine in 1678 in a sample of human semen. Soon after, it was found in human sperm. Kind of like taurine. They first found taurine in bull testicles, I believe. So they named it after Taurus, the bull. So that's why I was like, there's got to be something with sperm in this one. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know. I need to see more long-term safety data on spermidine before I, uh, before I pass any judgment. We've been, we've been re-looking at, Kelsey and I have been re-looking at um, leucine. recently so when we when we have this lens we can re-look at things we can look at new things we can re-look at things and see if we think that the key thing folks the duration paradox many things look good short term because they shut down detox and so you see things improve but long term they are absolute disasters people ignore this they're like oh this two-week study like the, the boron study where they gave these guys like 10 milligrams of boron a day and they're like, oh, it increased their free testosterone by like 44% and all this stuff. But then you look at the animal studies and you see long-term supplementation of boron causes infertility. And you go, oh, short-term, it looks good for testosterone and sperm production and whatever. And then long-term, it absolutely destroys it. Think of it as like making the engine run too fast. Yes, you go faster at the beginning, but you burn out the engine quicker. There... You don't get something for nothing. There is always a payoff if you are trying to hack the system. Biohacking is like the craziest, dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Like the word hacking. You don't get to hack your system. The toll will be paid. You don't get to hack the system. Once you understand that, and then you start going, oh, well, why don't we just make the system run as well as it possibly could instead of trying to hack it, then you're on the right track. So let me find that. Okay, so tone, tone truck. Wait, let me get off of this. Hold on. Wait. There we go. Says, I have a relative that suffers from MS, multiple sclerosis, and was wondering if you could share some of your ideas on this topic and or do a live stream on this subject. Thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge. I mean, I I, I could. I could do that. I, I just, some of these, some of these conditions like MS, I think there's actually really not very much research on. Um, Like, let's just go, let's just go do something. See if there's any copper stuff. Whenever I hear neurodegeneration, I go I go straight to copper. And then they call it wait, dysregulated copper transport. Oh, the body's not moving the copper around properly, and that's why you've got these problems. We can't say copper's toxic. Dis or, or they'll say signaling. So this is, I'm just going to, this is the only thing I'm going to do on this one today. Just, just like as a quick, um, we found a higher concentration of copper in multiple sclerosis patients than healthy controls. The magnitude of association was higher in studies that measured copper concentration in the plasma and cerebrospinal fluid. So the association of high copper was even higher, stronger when they looked at brain fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. Oh my goodness. Let's keep going. This is not, is this the same one? A systematic review and meta-analysis? Yeah, this is, this is the same paper. Toxic heavy metal concentrations. Well, how would we get those into our blood? Oh, toxic leaky bile. Poor.
pooled results using random effects model showed that the levels of lead, arsenic, and cadmium were significantly higher in MS patients than in the controls. So we got more toxic metals. Oh, here, let me put the link. Oh, goodness. Wait, am I at the bottom? Hold on. There we go. This other paper too. Let's see this one. So this is just a quick, you know, off the cuff thing. And again, this is how they lie to you. Dysregulated copper transport. I don't know. Is it, is it like dysregulated copper transport when we have migrants being dropped off at our cities? Is that dysregulated transport of migrants? Is that, is it causing problems? I, oh, uh, maybe. Just dysregulated transport. They're just not getting to where they need to go. This is how they lie to you. So let's see. <laughs> Collectively, these data demonstrate a pathogenic disease causing demyelination the covering of the nerves where the where the nerve the nerve signal travels is on the myelin sheath the outside of the nerve so demyelination is very bad so collectively these data demonstrate a pathogenic demyelination mechanism via the astrocyte those are that's a type of um brain cell release of copper wait so it's releasing copper and it's causing problems like free copper is like super damaging and open up the, this is, this is how they're going to treat you with drugs. It's going to open up the possibility of restoring co copper homeostasis, whatever the hell that means, in the white matter as a therapeutic target in MS. We're going to restore copper homeostasis. How about if you stop putting the poison in? Imagine that. Let's do this one here in the... Oh, if I didn't already put that there, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to see, I don't, I don't, I haven't looked at this paper yet, but I'm going to guess, I'm going to take a wild guess that the copper is higher in the MS people and the zinc is lower. I'm going to take a wild guess. Oh, they didn't find a considerable difference. Well, wait, 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 wait. Let's let's not let's not be so quick. Just because the scientists say there isn't a difference doesn't mean there wasn't a difference. The average serum level of copper in cases MS and controls was 93.7 and 88.9, respectively. Hmm. The corresponding numbers for zinc were 36.7 and 40.9, respectively. So then the next sentence they say there was no significant difference between the groups. I, I see a I see a difference. Do, do you not see a difference? I see a difference. There seems to be a pattern. And we have other papers showing that copper is higher in MS patients. Let's just let's just go and do this. Let's do let's see if there's anything to back up. Just go see if there's any other patterns of zinc. A systematic review and meta-analysis. The emerging role of zinc in the pathogenesis, the disease-causing process of multiple sclerosis. Gosh, what do you think we're going to find here, folks? Should I do a whole show on MS? The results of this meta-analysis shows a reduction in serum or plasma zinc levels in patients with MS with a 95% confidence interval and a p-value of 0 0.001 for the difference of zinc concentration in micromoles. Mm. 
Now, here's the funny thing. I want to explain this to you. One of six studies measuring cerebrospinal fluid, remember we found the copper was high in cerebrospinal fluid in that other paper. Zinc levels found a significant increase in patients with MS with controls. Your body will move zinc to where the copper is because the zinc protects you from the copper. So finding high zinc where you found the highest copper makes sense. The body is trying to protect you and it's taking zinc from everywhere else and it's moving it to try to protect your nervous system. Or remember how we've talked about when they give copper chelators, they often see the disease improve. They see less disease. They see less intense disease. How about if they give a zinc chelator? Oral administration of a, a zinc chelator. Wait, is this not? This is interesting. Oh, this is that one paper. I remember seeing this paper. This is where they're trying to like, they're, they're really going after zinc hard. They're like, yeah, they're trying to, they're really trying to, Zinc release from presynaptic terminals may be involved in MS. Well, didn't we just go over how the copper was destroying the myelin sheath? Copper and zinc are put together. I can show you on labs that copper and zinc will go up and down together as you give zinc. As you give zinc and you start ri raising the zinc levels, the copper levels will also go up until you have given enough zinc to overpower the copper, and then the copper goes down and the zinc stays up. So this is why with MS, MS is a weird condition. It's a very weird condition. But let's just go do this. Let's go do bile, multiple, this be the last thing on this. Actually, let me do one more thing. I want to see if there's any supplementation studies. Why are they not supplementing it? Why is it so difficult to find supplementation of it? Okay, so see, this is where, so people might have, so, so the haters might have been watching me there and going, Oh, well, Dr. Smith doesn't like this because they're finding zinc problems and that doesn't go with his narrative. So do you understand that I'm going to prove that wrong by finding studies on zinc supplementation helping? Do you see how I can prove all that wrong? So all these mechanisms can be complete BS because then we go, we look at the bigger picture and we go, well, what does giving zinc do in the situation. Studies of zinc supplementation have shown reduced T cell activation and proliferation, thereby being a promising approach in a future therapeutic manner. Now, they also always give the crappiest forms of zinc that they possibly could. So they gave, they did this one, a recent study, no improvements with 12 weeks of zinc supplementation. They were probably giving zinc sulfate or zinc oxide or some other garbage form of zinc. So let's see. What is this? Another approach by Choi et al. with redistributing zinc in the body with clioquinol, a copper or zinc chelator. Well, which one is it? How can it be or? Shouldn't it be and? Because it's not select anyway. Has shown promising results in the animal model of MS, experimental autoimmune encephalitis. We've shown studies on encephalitis and bile. So let's go. So yeah, that's all. That's the one supplementation study they have. Oh, oh, bile acid metabolism is altered in MS. 
and supplementation ameliorates neuroinflammation. Oh God, what are they giving? Are they going to give Udka? Tudka. They're going to give Tudka. So, oh, this is a cell study. To mechanistically examine the implications of lower levels of bile acids in MS. Lower levels of bile acid. Gosh, you mean like they're not making bile and they're building up toxicity because they can't get rid of it? We studied the in vitro cellular effects of an endogenous bile acid, torodeoxycholic acid on astroglite and microglial polarization. So you can tell by this, the title of the study that they got results with this. And I'm going to tell you that the duration paradox says that if they do things in cells that seem to show benefit in the whole body, it will make it worse. That's the general pattern. So this is because they're, they're only going through one cell. They're not going through multiple cellular turnovers. We demonstrated that bile acid metabolism was altered in MS. Okay, duh. And that bile acid supplementation prevented polarization of astrocytes and microglia to neurotoxic phenotypes and ameliorated neuropathology in an animal model of MS. So what could you expect it to do in real people long term? This is a secondary bile acid, people. This is not a joke. These are the most toxic bile acids in the human body. Udka, urso deoxycholic acid, they named it urso because they found it in bears, is a toxic secondary bile acid. And Udka with a T, Tudka is simply taurine bound to Udka. They are both secondary bile acids. Not going to solve a bile problem by giving bile acids. Now, can you change the bile acid recipe and make things look better? Yes. But what's happening underneath it? The same process is still going on. Okay. So anyway, so that's, that's a quick, Joe, did I get all the links? Maybe not all the uh, zinc links. Here, let me go and do these. Here's the zinc supplementation. You think you got all the links? Okay, you think I got all the links? Great. Okay, so let me let me move this down. So I got something in my eye. Anyway. So yeah, maybe we'll do a whole show on MS. I don't know, but definitely MS is absolutely toxicity. One of the things that we see. There's almost a way that you could recognize MS. Now, um, let me see who, who's, who's, who posted that question? What was your name? Tone truck. Okay. This is something some of you guys may, may recognize this with MS. There's almost always seborrheic dermatitis on the scalp. Seborrheic dermatitis is a dermatitis that just so happens to be yellow and oily, greasy. With MS people, you often see a lot of hair thinning and you see greasiness to their scalp and you often see a yellow kind of crusty plaque, which is the seborrheic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis, folks, is deep toxicity. That's really deep toxicity. That takes a long time to get rid of. Don't expect that to go away real quick. That takes a while. So I remember observing that the, the, the greasy scalp, the, the seborrheic dermatitis on the scalp multiple times in MS people, they're, they're pushing out toxicity through their skin and just so happens to be right by their brain coincidence. Um, and what do I think of when I think of skin issues? I think of zinc and what zinc fights against, which would be copper and vitamin A. I bet, I think I've looked this up before. I think in MS, you're going to find low levels of serum vitamin A. Because as we were just talking about, they're not pushing out bile. The vitamin A and the copper are mostly getting stuck in their liver.
Vitamin A deficiency. That's why they're pushing out yellow stuff through their scalp. I would bet if you go, they're going to have these studies and people are going to be like, but they have this research. And I'm going to say, when have you ever heard of them using this in MS? 2014. Why aren't they giving Accutane? Why aren't they giving Accutane for Alzheimer's? They did a bunch of studies on retinoic acid. They published a bunch of pa well, they published a bunch of theoretical papers, and then they've never used it. Why is that? Because the theory sounds great. In practice, it probably ruined people, and they hid those studies. So this is a whole BS. This is this is this is a gaslighting paper. Vitamin A is important. Vitamin A is important. Vitamin A is important. It might help. The results from the present review should encourage clinical trials. Oh, you mean they didn't have any? They didn't have any trials? <laughs> You're just making stuff up now. The molecular mechanism. Wait, I'm going to guess this is another gaslighting paper. It sounds good. It sounds amazing. There's no research going on here. We're just taking stuff and telling people all this looks, sounds good. Thus, the results from the current review suggest that vitamin A can be considered as a potential treatment in MS disease management. Do you see how this is just, it's just gaslighting, gaslighting, gaslighting? Like, we're going to tell you that it's good, just like all the other dorks on YouTube. And it's never going to come out as good. Let me, let me put this here. Let's go see if the third paper was another one of the same. What did we do? 2015 in Iran. Well, one of the, the only places here, let me, before I go into this, the only places where you ever see vitamin A help is in places where people are significantly malnourished. Protein, calorie, Nutri malnutrition where they don't get enough protein and they don't get enough calories. And for some reason, when they give vitamin A to these people, sometimes they see improvements. So I'm just setting you up with that before we go into this, because it's a ran and this is a possibility here. What do we do? What is MFCSC score? Okay. Look at this. The treated group received 25,000 units a day retinal palmitate for six months, followed by 10,000 IUs a day retinal palmitate for another six months. Okay. The multiple sclerosis functional composite MF MSFC. They looked at relapse rate. They looked at MRIs. They looked at the expanded disability status, status scale. What did we see? It improved this score, but it did not change the relapse rate. It did not change the brain lesions. It did not change the EDSS. Expanded disability status scale. So it didn't make them any less disabled. It didn't change the brain lesions. They got a little better score, but like I said, this only happens in malnourished places in general. What do you think would have happened if they continued supplementing at those doses? <laughs> They're going to get sick. Nope. So anyway, yeah, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be throwing, um, I wouldn't be throwing vitamin A at it. So anyway, that's what we got. That was kind of a mini, um, but again, this is duration paradox. How long was this? 12 weeks? Though they got six months followed by for another six months. So they got a year of it a year of it and they didn't get any less disabled. They didn't have any less brain lesions. 
and they didn't have, what was that other one? A year. Didn't change the relapse rate. Boy, that's not very successful now, is it? Hmm. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, oh, wow. This is really. Okay. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up. I got to go do the inner circle now. I almost, I almost started on time and I'm almost going to end on time. <laughs> I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Okay. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you get announcements. Um, if you want to work with me, go to the nutritiondetective.com page and look under testing and consultation. You can work with me. You can work with Nathan. Um, we're trying, we're going to be potentially training, doing a, doing a web, an online training seminar. Um, I've done two of them before and it is getting to be about time. Please don't bother Julie by emailing her about when it's coming out because you'll know when it comes out. Don't bother Julie with emails that are unnecessary. Thank you very much. That helps. So we announce things pretty well. We've got the email newsletters. We've got all the social media. We've got all that stuff. You'll hear about it when it's time. So anyway, we got that going on. If you want to any of the supplements that we have, um, hopefully we're going to have lactoferrin out again soon. And uh, we're working on reformulation of the Keystone Minerals with the new zinc niacinate and different forms of selenium in it. So we get more sulfur out of it because I practice what I preach and I don't want selenomethionine in it anymore. So we will be working on that. Hopefully you all enjoyed this. Don't forget if you, if you left in stuff in the chat, don't forget to leave a comment. Um, any comment will do the algorithm, you know, loves them all. So anyway, have a great day. I will see you all next time for number 134. Bye now.